Well, hello, Woodman. If you are new or visiting at one of our campuses uh, this morning, uh, my name's Josh, and I'm one of the pastors here. And we have been studying the life of the Old Testament prophet Elijah. As far as prophets went, Elijah was one of the tops. He was one of the greatest. He stood boldly for God. Uh, God did like epic, miraculous things through him. Elijah was one of two Old Testament characters to stand with Jesus at his transfiguration. You'll note, however, that we didn't entitle the series The Great Prophet. Instead, we've called it The Torn Prophet. Uh, because while Elijah did some great and mighty things, he was simply a guy with a nature like ours. And he also suffered deep discouragement and spiritual depression. Last weekend, we looked at what was Elijah's lowest point and God's response to him. God doesn't criticize him. God doesn't chastise him. But rather, he sends an angel to hang out with him, cook him some food, tuck him in so he can have a little bit of a nap must have been some super meal because Elijah would go in the strength of that food for the next 40 days, traveling to a place called Mount Horeb, also known as Mount Sinai. And Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, is the place where God met another Old Testament guy named Moses. Coincidentally, the second Old Testament character that stood with Jesus at his transfiguration. Now, for me, I'd like to think, I'd like to think that if I was discouraged and God sent an angel to hang out with me, even if he cooked nothing, that that would, just in and of itself, hello, ho, ho, hi, that that in and of itself would brighten my mood. But... Unfortunately, Elijah remains in a pretty dark place. Forty days after, he still is in the valley. And God is going to minister to Elijah. God is going to get him back on track. How he does it? may surprise us, and frankly, we may not like it. From God's perspective, time to get back in the game, Elijah. Time to set some things straight. Still doesn't criticize, still doesn't chastise, but it, it, it's, it's truth and love time. So if you are here in a valley, this is big boy, big girl stuff. I want to pray that God uses it to encourage you. Let's do that. Heavenly Father, again, I just thank you uh, for a book that contains the stories of not just heroes, but some very normal men and women like us. God, I ask that you would use your word in our lives today, that you would shape us by it, God, I ask that you would help me not to make any mistakes and be glorified in your church. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you have a Bible, turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. We're at verse 9. The struggle is real. If you are in a valley, if you are discouraged today, that's legit. It happens. Verse 9 says, Then, oh, there he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, What are you doing here? Elijah. A couple things that are kind of fun is that when it says a cave in Hebrew, it literally says the cave, leading a lot of people to think this is the cave that Moses was in. It's the same cave. And then the editor, the writer, says, behold, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, which is kind of fascinating because we've seen time and time again the word of the Lord come to Elijah before, never with like a behold before it. 
I think the editor, like some of us, kind of thinks like, Elijah's in such a bad mood. Like, there's no way God wants to talk to him right now. <laughs> but behold, God does. And God asks him a question, which is a little unique. What are you doing here? Leaving last week, and you sort of get the sense that the angel had maybe told Elijah to go, but now we find out Elijah's here on his own. And it's, it's probably never good when God asks, what are you doing somewhere? Because it would seem to say you shouldn't be there. Elijah is in a dark spot. Look at how he responds. Verse 10, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. While clearly fortified by the spiritual food, it did not help his disposition. He is still in a really dark place. And I'll tell you, I find his response... (laughs) both convicting and gratifying. I find it gratifying because it's nice to see someone so immature just like me in the Bible. I find it convicting because I'm like, do I really sound like that sometimes? Elijah is in such a funk. And like we often do, he blows things out of proportion. And he spins only negative. Have you ever done that? He's got a little bit of an ego going. I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. (laughs) You can almost see an angel wanting to be like, not right now. Uh -uh, You have been, have been before, but you ran away like over a month ago. He's a little bit judgy. I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel, like all y'all, have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. Mm, That's not entirely true. Actually, when you were still on the job, you led a great service of repentance when a bunch of Israelites turned back to you. Not all the altars are torn down because you guys actually built that other one up. And to be clear, it's not Israelites going killing the prophets, it's Jezebel. And then he plays just a little bit of the victim card. I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. It didn't always used to be just you. You actually dismissed your servant. You had a guy with you all the time. You told him to go away. And there was Obadiah. Obadiah stood for God, and Obadiah was actually protecting those hundred prophets that were standing for God. You're not the only one. And though it's got to be bad when just one person wants to kill you, just for clarity's sake, they, plural, don't want to kill you. She, Jezebel, does. He was taking things that were kind of true but then spinning them more negative, building them up. Just like I think we so often can find ourselves doing. It's not all that different. Um, Well, have you ever heard the phrase, uh, never let your pride or the truth get in the way of a good story? I mean, that's not biblical advice, so I'm not like saying that from the front officially. I... I do think it's safe to say, though, if you give full vent to your pride and overlook the truth, you will always end up with nothing good. If you give full vent to your pride and then overlook what is actually true, it never goes anywhere good. It's like the kid who's got a lot of friends, but then Jimmy doesn't invite him to his birthday party. And the birthday party night comes Friday, and the kid's like, no one likes me, I have no friends. You're like, you have lots of friends. You just, you, you don't even like Jimmy. I, no one likes me. I mean, that's not true. College student, she gets one poor grade on one assignment. I'm so stupid. No, actually, you're not. You, you get really good grades. You just didn't do well on this one. I'm dumb. It's like my wife. 
the house is freezing. The thermostat says 69. This is well above freezing. <laughs> it's not freezing, but I feel it. <laughs> and feelings do not make something true. When we are discouraged, listen, when, you, when we are discouraged and spinning only negative, we have to change the channel. We have to change the narrative that we're telling ourselves. What's fascinating, if any of us went home today and found like an open flame burning on our stovetop, we would all put it out. And yet when our pride is a little wounded and, and there's a little spark of discontent in our soul, we're like throwing sticks on it. We're like, <sighs> we, we try, we try and tell ourselves things that only inflame us more. When we are discouraged, one of the best things we can do is ensure that the things that are discouraging us are actually true. Had Elijah had a rough go? Yes. Are there things that are difficult, low valleys we walk through? Yes. But there are, there are times when things are not as bad as we're leading ourselves to belief. When we do so, I can't remember who said it, but we, but we tend to all make our problems seem bigger than they really are and, and, and then tend to make God smaller than he actually is. Are you doing that like now? If you are in a valley this morning, are your reasons for being there actually true? Or like Elijah, are you spinning negative? Good news is the Lord is patient with us. Look at verse 11. And he said, go, this is God speaking, go out and stand on that mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Psalm 103, verse 8 says, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And I'll tell you, that is what's happening right here to Elijah. And I've read this passage many times in my life, and I'll there's just a couple things in it that are a little kind of wonky, and I've just kind of gone right by. But this week, as I've studied it, I, I mean, I've fallen in love with God all over again. He, has, he is so gracious, so patient. But I do love, right out of the gate, God does not even acknowledge Elijah's, like, pity speech. Like, it's like it just God's like, okay, whatever. Go stand. <laughs> Go out of the cave and stand before the Lord. And if you were with us at the beginning of Elijah, this is sort of intriguing because the first words we have recorded as coming from Elijah's mouth is in 1 Kings 17, verse 1, where Elijah says, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand. First thing he ever says to somebody is, I stand before the Lord. But on this day, he's hanging back in the darkness of the cave. And God says, go out of the cave and stand before the Lord. And if you look down at verse 13, Elijah's like, no. 
He stays, he stays back. And it says, and behold, the Lord passed by, which is the same thing God did in the same place for Moses hundreds of years before. And God turns on the special effects. Wind is howling and bringing rocks down. There is an earthquake shaking the place. And I, if I'm in the back of the cave during the earthquake, I'm moving forward. I don't want to be in the back of the cave during an earthquake. But then the fire from heaven starts falling. God is, it's like his greatest hits all at once. But at each time, the Lord's not in it. And then it says, the sound of what? The sound of a low whisper. In Hebrew, it actually says, a thin silence. I love that this miraculous greatest hits show, but nothing. But then in the thin silence, Elijah hears it and responds, moving from the back of the cave forward. And God asks the very same question. What are you doing here, Elijah? And there's a point that we can overlook that shows Elijah, even in his valley, is sort of cognizant of something's not not right. You see it says, as Elijah came forward, he he covered his face in his cloak. And and, and we can read it and think, that's weird, but it's not. Moses the guy that was in this very same place probably, the reason he was there is he had asked God if he could see God's glory. And God was like, you know what, that's just an admirable question. But you have no idea what you're talking about. Because as a created thing, if you were to behold my glory, you will just die. You cannot handle it. But tell you what I'm going to do. We're going to put you in the cleft of the rock. And I'm going to hold my hand up. Shelter you a little. And at the very last minute, when my back's towards you, I'm going to give you a little glimpse. And trust me, though little glimpse it will be, it'll blow you away. And now Elijah's in the very same place. And God is saying, come forward. But what's absent you're going to want to be careful, Elijah. It's almost like Elijah's like, oh, this is how I go. And he wraps his face to try to protect himself from the glory of God. Because in the thin silence, he knows that God is there. And God asks the very same question, what are you doing here? The truth of the matter is while Elijah was discouraged and while that God does not chastise him for the discouragement, the facts of the matter did not warrant the discouragement Elijah was experiencing. And so God says to him, what are you doing here? Could that be happening to you? When, when we get discouraged, there's two things we need to remember. First, our feelings are not always a good indicator of what is actually happening. Sometimes it's like we're, 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 we're a person who's panicked about running out of gas, even though the gauge says full, and you're kind of like, it's, it's okay, we have lots of fuel. But our feelings can get the best of us. And Satan loves to capitalize on those feelings. When we're spinning negative, he is more than happy to make us feel worse. And second, when we are in a valley, when we're discouraged, obviously we'd love to think that God would break through, do something miraculous, shake the earth and bring us out. But I tell you, more often than not, He comes in a silence. 
He comes in the quiet. But he comes. God's presence was not in the miraculous displays of power. That day, his presence was in the thin silence, and Elijah heard it. Do you need that? Do not overlook the fact God was in the quiet. His presence was there. If you are in a valley, you need to stop spinning negative. But in the quiet of wherever it is you are, to get before God and listen. Tell you the Lord is patient. He will wait for you. But he doesn't mind saying, what are we doing here? What are we really upset about? What's up, Elijah? God's answer to him is participation. Look at verse 14. Elijah's response. I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. He rehearses, he gives the same pity speech verbatim. Angels everywhere are like, you're kidding me, this guy, right? Like, all that you just beheld, and, and Elijah doubles down and says it again because the struggle is real. And given how deep the valley he's in and how intensely he feels these things that aren't even true, and even though it's God speaking, Elijah doesn't want to hear it. Doesn't want to hear it. And just gives the same speech that probably he's been rehearsing for 40 days. You know, a lot of this, we're we're looking at it from the perspective of when we're in the valley, we want to learn from this. But maybe as an aside, this is pretty instructive for those of us who are dealing with people who are in the valley when we're not. When someone's down, when someone's discouraged, our obvious natural tendency is to say, brighten up, it's okay, it's not that bad. And sometimes people don't want to hear it. And you might need to give them some space. If the almighty God of the universe can bring rocks down with wind, shake the earth with an earthquake, and then drop serious flame and not phase a guy's heart, I don't think you and I have enough up our sleeve to really communicate. Are there times when people need a stern snap out of it? Yes. And God being God, he knows that this is the spot after 40 days that Elijah's in. But sometimes people just need a little space. And we need to have the spiritual discernment to know when is it that I just need to sit with them, let them vent, let them cry, hold their hand. And when do I need to bring some truth? God is going to bring some truth but we're 40 plus days in. This wasn't the first thing God did. The first thing God did was angel, food, have a nap. But now he's going to bring Elijah in. He's going to invite Elijah again to participate in what he's doing. Look at verse 15. And the Lord said to him, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. 
and Jehu, the son of Nimshai, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Maholah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. This is where God brings reality to bear. And he knows he needs to get Elijah back in the game. He gives him a threefold assignment. First, you're going to go anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And this is fascinating because Syria was not a part of Israel. And Hazael was a pagan. And we sometimes think that that might be out of God's like scope. But God's the sovereign Lord of the universe. He makes kingdom rise and fall. And he's like, you go tell that guy that I'm saying he's going to become king. Second assignment, you're going to go anoint Jehu to be the next king of Israel. This does not bode well for Ahab and his re-election hopes, but there's going to be a new king coming. And then thirdly, you're going to go anoint a man named Elisha. He's going to replace you and be your successor. And then he tells him, this plan's actually going to work. If Hazael doesn't get it done, Jehu will. And if Jehu doesn't get it finished, Elisha's going to circle up and get all that I'd like to see finished. And then in one sort of biting statement, it's almost like God's like, there is one thing I'm going to correct. Your math is off by about 7,000. You're not the only one. There's actually 6,999 others who have not bowed to Baal. And there are sort of three distinct lessons, none of which are easy to hear if you're currently in a valley. But if you're not, this can help when we find ourselves in one. When spiritually depressed, we tend to take ourselves out of the game. And God would always invite us to participate. What is wild is God does not ask Elijah to participate at the same level he was. Confronting Ahab, hard. Confronting 450 prophets of Baal, very difficult. This is low-hanging fruit. You're going to go anoint a guy and tell him he's going to be king. He's going to like it. You're going to anoint another guy tell him he's going to be king. He's going to like it. And Elisha's really decent. You're going to like him. It's going to be fine. But what you cannot do is nothing. No more running away. You are going to get involved. And when we're depressed, when we're in the valley, the last thing I want is to see any of you. I don't want people. I want to wallow. I want to be by myself. And God's like, nope. Are there times we need to take a strategic step back? Yes. Are some of you doing too much? For certain. Do you want to hear from the front? You should do less. You should do less. But you should not quit everything. We've said... If you, have, if you only have one slot, get in a community group. You get in God's word, you get some people in your life, they can minister to you, you can minister to people, and I know some of you have had bad experiences. I went to a group, I didn't like it. A lot of you didn't like a lot of people you dated, but you kept trying. Like, I mean, just <laughs> give it another shot. Give it another shot. Find another group. But you've got to do something. Maybe thinking of being in a group on Tuesdays too much. Okay, maybe there's a trip coming up in like March in that little thing and you're like, God, I am low, but I'm going to put something on my calendar and see what you do between now and then because I'm going to get on a plane and I'm going to serve you. When we're depressed, we take ourselves out of the game. God's like, Elijah, you're going to participate. Here's the second lesson. God, do God can do the miraculous, but we should not always expect it. Elijah desires the destruction of Baal and his people. So does God. Elijah's kind of A plus plan. Let's just do the earthquake fire thing. I'll point him out. You do your thing. We could wrap this up in like 11 days. What's God's plan? I have a geopolitical thing I'm going to work on. 
where I'm going to raise up a pagan king over there. I'm going to put a new king over Israel and another prophet coming after you. And make no mistake about it, my thing's going to get done. When we're in the valley, when we're low, we yearn for the miraculous. God often chooses to take his time. Moses, on the very same mountain that he encountered God, years before that, he had encountered God. The same place in a burning bush. But for 40 years, he was a shepherd before he saw that burning bush. For reasons I do not entirely understand, there are 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Why did God wait? I don't really know. Jesus, Jesus, the Son of God, didn't start his ministry until he was 30, and I bet he was a pretty good preacher at 27. We yearn for God to step in the valley and just fix. And he says, I will fix. But you might not be around here anymore. You want God to intercede. I get it. So do I. But if God's history is any indication, he's going to steady Eddie this thing in your life. And we need to be okay with that. God is patient. Do you need to be? Finally, the last lesson, and this is the hardest. God will always be the hero in his story. God will always be the hero in his story. It's never to be us. Part of Elijah's problem was he had begun to think above his pay grade. He was the only one. He was doing so much. Everybody else was falling short. And God's like, it's just not true, dude. You are replaceable. And you're going to meet the man. God does not say it mean to him. But God reminds him that I have plans that go far beyond you. You're not the hero in this story. I am. And I know that is incredibly hard to hear. A lot of us grew up in homes where moms and dads told us we were special. We went to schools where teachers told us we could be anything we wanted to be. We have a culture that tells us again and again and again, we deserve to be happy. And at the end, God's like, you are a sinner saved by grace, and I am the sovereign. And he is the champion of the story. And we get to participate, and by God's grace, thank you, because it's awesome. But let's never forget the characters in the story. And the hero is Jesus. Do you need to take a step back? Are you upset? Not with God's plan, but with the role you're playing in it. I will tell you, and this seems crazy, but when you wrap your mind, when you wrap your heart around this, it is so incredibly freeing because he's the hero in the story and not me. The world doesn't rest on my shoulders. I'm free to fail. I'm free to forget. I'm free to have some bad days because my sovereign God is alive and Jesus didn't stay dead. He got up and my hope and my future is bound up with him. And sometimes I can just sit down and chill out. Do you need to remember who the hero is? It takes a lot of pressure off, I'll tell you. Bad news is it's not you. Good news is it's not you. Find your joy in Jesus. Verse 19 says, so Elijah departed from there. And he found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him. And he was with the 12th. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, go back again, for what have I done to you? 
And he returned from following him. He took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen and gave it to the people and they ate. And then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. We don't know anything about Elijah's backstory, but we learn a lot about Elisha. Elisha obviously came from a wealthy family because not only was he plowing with like one set of oxen, there was another 11 in the line, which means that they not only had enough money for the oxen, but they had enough land to need them. And, and, and Elijah walks by and takes his cloak, the same one he just wrapped around his head, and he throws it on Elisha, which seems rather weird, but it's kind of where we get the idea of kind of passing the mantle. Odd thing, but Elisha at that minute knew exactly what was going on. He was like, oh my goodness gracious, I did not wake up this morning thinking this was going to happen, but he runs after Elijah. And then grasping the significance of what he's just beheld, he says, can I go kiss my mom and dad goodbye? Because I'm in this. And it's sort of an internet... uh, an odd thing that Elijah responds that perplexes commentators. Some think he's just really grumpy about it. I think Elijah's just saying, I'm not stopping you, man. And Elisha burns the bridges. He burns, he literally roasts his two oxen, uses the yoke to be the fire, has a feast for everybody. Once they're all eaten full up, he goes and follows Elijah. And in doing so, this is not all that different than when Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee and said, you, 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 and you, come follow me. And those four fishermen with their nets were like, we are in. And they went. It's not easy for us to acknowledge this. But truthfully, a lot of us want to find our joy in our circumstances and situations. Jesus unreservedly asks you to find your joy in him. I wish I could tell you in the valley that God has promised to change the circumstance that's bringing you down. I cannot. But what I can tell you is that Jesus' words in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 29, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. If you are in a valley this day, I tell you Jesus is calling you to himself. Jesus is calling you to find your rest in him, The first part about that is you need to acknowledge Jesus for who he is. And apart from Jesus Christ, I have nothing I can tell you that will solve the torment some of our souls are in. You must acknowledge Jesus as Lord, believe that he died, was buried, and rose again, and acknowledge that you need him. And he wants to give you help. And I know a lot... There's a lot of us here, and you might be like, you know, you're saying he wants to help me, but you're not Jesus. Your name's Josh. You said that at the top. That's fair. Who called Elisha? Well, Elijah did from Elisha's perspective. But who told Elijah to do it? God. I say a lot of things wrong in my life. I'm well acquainted with making mistakes. But I'm going to nail this. Jesus says to you this day, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Jesus says that to you. It may be in the silence. It may not look like much. But if you listen you can find rest for your soul. Do you need that? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's, it's, 
it's weird to talk recognizing that for so many of us, we're at different spots. Some of us are feeling pretty good, and if you said stand at the front of the cave, we would have bound up there with joy. Others of us would be trying to dig further back in. God, I pray that in these moments we have that, Father, you would speak to our hearts. We're going to leave this place. We're going to leave these rooms and go back to our life. And so, Father, we sing to you. We call to you. We need rest. We're only going to find it in your son, Jesus. Meet with us now. Amen.